So welcome everybody. This is our fifth lecture of our second Bite Size Animal Law series. Um, and for those of you who are new, just joining us, this series is about animal law, social justice, and their interconnectedness. And tonight we are so thrilled to have with us Alexandra Pimmer. Um, she is coming from France. So um, thank you very much, Alex, for being here this evening. And she is going to discuss human rights and responsibility in the Anthropocene age. Alexandra Pimmer is a senior lecturer in public, UK and EU law. And she is the co-author of Unlocking EU Law, um, along with T Tony Story. Um, her studies explore the intersection between law, governance, and spirituality, not in a religious sense, but in, um, in that of the mind at both European and international levels. More broadly, she is a scholar engaged in earth activism with a special focus on advancement of nature rights and the reframing of legisprudential and ju jurisprudential orders. Based on the ecology of law, earth jurisprudence and ethics, and a conscious governance paradigm. So welcome, Alexandra, and thank you again for giving up your time to be with us this evening. Um, thank you for having me. <laughs> just to get you started, um, Alexandra, can you tell us, obviously you're not an animal, uh, animal law lawyer, so how did you come about to write this paper? Um, Okay, yes, yeah, so I'm not an animal lawyer at all, um, but I am interested in the rights of nature and I am interested in how we interact um, with nature within our systems of governance, how we interact with each other, how we apprehend, how we understand our role um, within the world that we live in and the reality that we create. Um, and more specifically, when I look at um, where we are at today, obviously with the pandemic, um, which has been um, said to be uh, created by human activity or as a result of human activity uh, and you know, uh, a lot of the disasters and crises that we're experiencing today uh, are definitely man-made. And on that basis, I've been interested um, in the advancement of rights of nature um, as a whole, um, and when I was asked to contribute a paper to a, um, a year ago to an animal law conference, I wondered how I could, you know, what I, I could actually contribute. Um, so I thought the only thing that I can talk about really is what I'm interested in, um, which is based on the psychology of consciousness. Um, how do we create our laws? And those laws create our reality. So how did we get to where we are today? How did we create a system that allowed us to actually destroy the earth um, and, and so that's what I'm going to try and talk about today. It's not so much going to focus on animal rights as such but on the its conceptualization um, and, and my focus really is on the narrative and how can we change the narrative um, and focusing on the concept of responsibility as well. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I'm going to just give a, um, an overview of where I'm coming from, how I'm looking at this. Um, I don't know how long it's going to take me, probably not that long, um, but certainly uh, what I'm more interested in actually is having a conversation um, because this is a subject that I have been interested in for quite a long time, but I, I realize that I'm looking at it from a, a different slant than most uh, lawyers. Uh, I'm not a doctrinal lawyer. Um, it's social legal, but like I said, it's very much inspired from uh, you know, my, my studies in, in uh, spirituality and all the psychology of spirituality and the psychology of consciousness. So um, the slide, well, next slide, thank you. Okay, so um, like I said, I'm interested. Um, oh, sorry, I think we've missed a slide. I think there wasn't. Oh, sorry, that's wrong. It doesn't matter. Don't worry about it. Uh, it yeah. Okay, so um, if, if you, you can go on to the next slide, it's all right. Uh, I'll, I'll follow on it. Um, okay, so I'm just going to give then a, a, a brief uh, context. Um, the I have been wondering about the relationship between human rights and between animal rights and between nature rights. 
and especially because um, we are actually living in the in what we call the Anthropocene. Um, and, and what is that supposed to mean? Essentially, it means the age of humanity. And although it started off as a, a, a geo, um, geological proposal, a scientific proposal, many argue actually that, that we can't scientifically really talk about uh, the Anthropocene age, because really um, it seems that the, the humanity story is, is kind of like a little blip in the overall story of, 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 the, of the Earth. Um, so my approach to the concept of the Anthropocene really is more um, sociopolitical, cultural, you know, it, it's, it's a concept, it's a notion, it's a theme. Um, and when I think about uh, the idea of, uh, uh, you know, um, the Anthropocene then, I look at the actions of human beings. That's what I'm interested in. How do human actions actually impact on the earth? How do we, why actually do we do what we do the way that we do and, and, and you know, how do we actually, uh, how are we held accountable for what we do? So, um, sorry, <laughs> I was on the other side there. Um, so I'm interested therefore in the idea that before we can talk about animal rights, before we can talk about human rights, before we can talk about nature rights, you know, for there to be a right, there has to be a responsibility. Somebody has to be responsible for providing that right. Somebody has, uh, you, know, you know, the rights are bestowed upon us. They are conferred upon us. So to have a system of rights, of protection, there has to be a responsibility. And when we look at uh, um, the age of humanity and the actions of humanity and the consequences that we have, then I think that what we can do and what we probably should do in the whole conversation about nature rights and animal rights is actually have a serious conversation about human responsibility. Um, and but to have that conversation about human responsibility means that we have to understand where we are coming from. Um, because as you can see um, on the slides, I've, I've, I've put this little diagram. I, I put that the rights are at the center, but, you know, and, and so you've got the rights at the heart of it, or, you know, the, 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 the rights, shall, shall we say, at the, the heart of the system of relationship between human beings and between human beings and our environment. So for there to be a right, there has to be a responsibility. For there to be a responsibility, sorry, I can't really see um, there. For there to be a responsibility, it's based on a system of value. So we have to establish the principles that matter to us, because according to these principles, then we will have actually, the, you know, we will, we will create our legal systems, we will create our legal orders, our systems of government and, and, and so on. But those values don't, don't come in a vacuum. They are created from an origin story. There is a source, uh, and that source is basically uh, the narrative. How do we view ourselves in this world? How do we view the world? So it is a matter of consciousness. Um, and so my, my approach is very much quantum-based in the sense that I, it, it's quantum-based as opposed to a materialist approach to the worldview. I see that we are part of the one whole. I see that we are interconnected, that we are interrelated, and that we are interdependent. And that's why I think all of these actually relate to each other. Um, but, and if you would like to move on to the next slide, Tiffany, please. But, uh, oh well, <laughs> sorry, that's going to be the next slide then. <laughs> there must have been a a problem. Okay, thank you. So um, the story that we have been telling ourselves overall is not a story of unity, particularly in the last few centuries. It's not a story of unity. It's a story of dominance. It's the story of superiority. It's a story that um, puts humanity or man 
at the very center of everything. No matter how much we have actually moved along, you know, to realize that actually the Earth is not the center of the universe, that, you know, we converge around the sun, that we, as, as humanity, we have not evolved from that conception. The Earth might not be the center of the universe, but, but humanity is. In our view, humanity is the center of the universe, and that, that comes from the narrative, our creation story. And um, that's what I've, I've recently been reading a, an absolutely amazing book um, called Ishmael um, by uh, David Quinn. And in that book, Ishmael is basically a gorilla who is a teacher and puts in an advert saying, teacher seeking a pupil. Uh, and the one prerequisite is that that pupil has to have a, a genuine desire to change the world. And that pupil is a human being being taught by a gorilla. And Ishmael the gorilla actually breaks down the story of humanity, how we got to where we are today. And he talks about the mother culture, which I thought was a really interesting concept because we tend to talk about Mother Earth as the basis for our ecological life. And the mother culture is the basis for how we view the world. And from this concept of mother culture, um, you know, he unravels how the story has come about. Now, from, from my understanding, the creation story, at least in the, in, the, in the Western world, is based on the Bible. God created the world, and then God created man. And it seems that, and in the order that it was created, in the way that it was created, it means two things. Man is the ultimate be-all and end-all. It's the absolutely, uh, the most perfect creation. The world was created for man then. The world was created for man to enjoy but eventually the world was created for man to rule, to control. So there is that paradigm of dominion where this anthropocentric mentality for me means two things. One, it means that within ourselves, we really believe as humanity that we are the superior species and that everything is owed to us and that we have dominion over the planet over the species over the environment and so the other angle is the outer consequence of that inner belief is the way that we behave we behave as though we really own the world as though we are separate as though we are not part of the community of the earth as though we are the superior species and everything else is just below for whatever reason I feel that actually that is a very skewed perception of humanity because uh, this anthropocentric view also means that we evaluate absolutely everything from that uh, point of reference. So we assume that personhood is based on human qualities. We assume that uh, sentience is based on human quality. We assume that worth is based on human quality. And I have an issue with all of this. I don't believe that we are superior. I don't believe that we are the be-all and end-all. Um, because, frankly, if, you know, we've seen with the pandemic, and I, I liked uh, uh, reading somewhere that it, it felt like it was the earth having had enough and sending us to our rooms for us to have a good think about the mess that we've created. Um, and whilst we were in our rooms, things changed in the world. The world doesn't need us. We need the environment, we need nature, we need the animals. So it is, uh, you know, that anthropocentric mentality um, needs to be changed. And to, to be changed, we need to change the narrative. We need to change the creation story. We need to change the source of the worldview that we hold so that we can change the values the principles that we hold dear. And to go back to the concept of consciousness, that's what it is. I feel that we have come into an age of consciousness. We are conscious of what we do. We are conscious of the consequences of our actions. Through our 
you know, relentless extraction and disrespect and abuse of natural resources um, are, you know, devastation of, of the, you know, forests and, and wildlife. We have created a world where everything is in danger because of ourselves, because of our behavior as humanity. Becoming conscious of this means also being conscious of the fact that we have made those choices. And today, I think we have even more the opportunity of becoming conscious of those choices because we have the absolute ability through the internet and everything to have access to so much information and not just from a westernized perspective. So we need to start getting inspired and, and acknowledging all of the other sources, you know, indigenous wisdom, uh, indigenous ways of looking at things, not just from this mechanistic Cartesian paradigm that the Western world has, uh, has you know, preferred for all of these uh, uh, centuries, but to actually, we can now really expand that awareness and that level of consciousness. And by expanding that consciousness, then that means that we have the information to make informed decisions. And by making those informed decisions, then, then we become responsible for our actions. So does that make sense so far? Yeah, okay, great. Do you want to move on to the next slide? Thank you. This one, Alex, or the other one? Oh, it's this one. It's great. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> so um, the... <sighs> The anthropocentric uh, mentality is based on that creation story that the world was made for humanity and that humanity has dominion. And that creation story was cemented, um, particularly throughout the Enlightenment and the Industrial, um, you know, throughout the Industrial Revolution, whereby uh, we then started viewing the world, viewing the universe, viewing the planet not as an organic living entity, but as a, as a machine, as a mechanistic thing um, that can be quantified, that can be broken down, that can be used, um, you know, and, and whose resources can be extracted to then be capitalized on. So we have evolved in the past few centuries in the Western world in particular, within a paradigm of duality, a paradigm of separation, and a paradigm of you know, hierarchy and dominion, like I said. Um, and that's where the problem is. So how do, we, how do we tackle this? Because this paradigm of separation and dominion has been championed, has been perpetuated, has been honed by our legal systems. The law is being used to enforce that paradigm. Um, there's a, an absolutely amazing book by uh, Fritjof Capra and Hugo Maté. Fritjof Capra is a scientist and Hugo Maté, who's a, who's a lawyer, um, The Ecology of Law. And, and that's what they actually discussed, the, the fact that we have gone from uh, you know, a respect for the commons, a respect for, you know, for the relationship with the land, uh, we have gone from that into a very mechanistic paradigm um, whereby, you know, natural resources and anything that is not human becomes a thing to be used, becomes an, an, a non, a non entity or non being, I guess, um, that can be, you know, extracted, abused, um, disrespected in, in, for our own benefit. So what I am what I am saying is that we need to change the narrative from the source. We need to review our approach to our creation story. And for that, we only have to look at science, you know, uh, uh, quantum theory in particular, because quantum theory is telling us that we are not alone. We are completely connected to one another. We are interrelated. We are interdependent. We are part of a whole community of life and we are all made of energy. Energy that then is, you know, is materialized in, into matter. Um, but then what matters 
within you know the human worldview this is where you know if we if we can actually start with this worldview of the interconnected interrelated world then we will have different values the values will not be i want to take this the values will be we will have to share we will have to look at how we do this in a collaborative way and uh, in in the book ishmael and uh, the, the story is very much about the takers and the leavers and so the takers is very much the mentality that we have we take we take and we don't we don't give back um and we take more than we than we need more than we should have whereas the leavers there is that sense of relationship there is a collaboration and if we see ourselves as part of this whole thing then we will collaborate with each other and we will collaborate with the environment and with the animals we will seek balance now I've, uh, I've put on this slide, the land is the source of the law. Now that's not from me, that's from C.F. Black. That's the title of her book. Um, she um, has been looking at indigenous jurisprudence and I very much like her approach and her analysis. Um, the, um, the cycle, the circles that you see reflect um, her methodology um, you know, for discussing indigenous jurisprudence and how it can relate uh, to us today as well. So you've got um, those three circles. The very the bigger circles, the bigger one is the cosmology and by the cosmology um, she means the creation story. And by the creation story, um, what she says is that people's cosmological creation story and events define their principles, ideals, values, and philosophies, which in turn inform their legal regime. So the cosmology or creation story has to be different. The world was not created for us. We were created by the world within the natural world. We are a part of nature. We are, in my view, we are both nature because we are an expression of that nature and we are a part of it as well. Then the, uh, the next circle, the next inner circle is what she calls the law of relationship, which essentially is the legal system or the, the legal order. She says the centrality of the legal relationship in the edifice of the legal ethos is that the land is the law. Therefore it is based on a relationship of balance and the balance of difference and and i'm not going to be able to actually go into this today as much but i think the whole concept of difference is so important as well when we look at um when we look at our systems of governance and, and how we relate um because the respect for difference the respect for diversity is the source of life uh, and, and, and we know that because if we did not have biodiversity, if we only had, you know, if we actually attack bio, you know, biodiversity to reduce it to just certain uh, species, um, we'll be gone, <laughs> basically. You know, if we, if, we, if we don't diversify, we eventually die out, we hit a dead end. So there has to be differences and we have to learn to live with differences. I mean, we're talking about this in the context of, of nature and animal rights, but you know, this is also very much relevant within the context of humanity itself when we talk about, you know, well, racism, for instance. Now, the inner circle, and from that concept of uh, the law of relationship, which in most indigenous um, um, communities then can be expressed in different ways, but the way that I seem to understand it is that essentially it's about the yin and the yang. You know, there's there's a sense of duality, um, or rather not duality, but um, uh, moieties, the, 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 the essentially two halves of the same thing. So if you think about the circle of the yin and the yang, you know, there is a balance. There is the positive and the negative, you know, uh, energy. There is the masculine and the feminine, you know, men and women. 
um, you know, we could even use it in terms of like state and, and religion, uh, uh, law and business and so on. It's understanding that there is actually a relationship and that we need to look at that balance, how that relationship is balanced, how it actually interreacts, interrelates, um, how those components uh, uh, react with each other. And, and finding that balance um, is important because essentially these various aspects are not opposite. They are not going against each other. They are complementary. So they work with each other. It's a collaborative, you know, harmonious approach to things. Um, so from that law of relationship, then we actually dig deeper and we go to the center where we are then looking at rights and responsibilities. <clears throat> And I really like um, the way um, C.F. Black actually states this, if I can find that quote again, or did I put it here? I'm not quite sure. Um, sorry, bear with me one second. I thought I had it somewhere. Right. When responsibilities to the land are taken up, this results in automatic rights. Those rights within human rights become the voice of authority. That is the validity of the law. Um, and essentially, what this means is that before there are any rights, there are responsibilities. And because those the systems that we create are, are man-made system, you know, the rights, the, 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 the legal order that we create, they're man-made. They're essentially there to regulate our behavior. They're there to regulate our, you know, societal relationships how we interact with each other and how we interact with our environment so from that cosmology where we are part of the community then the way that we're going to understand that if we're part of this community then we have to actually harmonize with that community and in the way to harmonize you know with that community then we will eventually learn to harmonize within ourselves there is first a sense of responsibility that we have to respect our environment we have to respect nature we have to respect other species does that make sense yeah <laughs> okay um do you want to move on to the next slide yeah okay my slides I know yeah okay right um so <clears throat> having said all of this I don't think that we can move away from an anthropocentric perspective of the world simply because we're human there's an expression that says you know we don't see the world as it is we see it as we are and, and usually it's, it's an expression that we use with, with other individuals. So I, I will tend to see, um, you know, traits that I recognize within myself, within others. So we understand the world from our own experience, from our own understanding of things. So we are bound to be anthropocentric in the way that we view the world, in the way that we interact with the world, in the way that we interact with each other. But what I am uh, suggesting is that we move away from what I term uh, anthropo-egocentrism and move towards anthropo-ecocentrism, where we use our consciousness not from a place of, you know, um, well, not from an egocentric place, not because we are human and we matter and we are superior and this and this and that, and, although that's not what ego is all about all the time, but from an ecological perspective, um, whereby we relate to the world as humans within, within a community, within that paradigm, of you know interrelatedness um and i, I like uh, um there's a quote again in ishmael um with man gone is there hope for gorilla and i and <laughs> it's funny 
in, in, in some ways because we talk about the rights of nature as if we're here to save nature. We talk about animal rights um, in the sense that we need to protect the animals. And we certainly do because our, our behavior, uh, you know, infringes upon their dignity. But in the bigger context of, uh, you know, nature and where we are today with climate change, with, you know, deforestation, uh, the pandemic, it's not about saving the world. It's not about saving nature. It's about saving humanity. It's about whether we're going to survive our own mess. It's about whether they will. I have two young children and I literally have no idea if they have a future on this earth. None. So that's why I'm interested in this because I ask myself, what can I do? What can we do? You know, the, we can talk and we can keep the same mindset that we've had up until now and we will literally end up exactly where that mindset is taking us. If there is no boundaries, if there is no parameters as to what humanity can do to this planet, we're doomed because we're dooming ourselves. I mean, unless we destroy the whole planet, we will definitely eradicate humanity. Once we go, life will persist nature will find a different way to flourish the planet will replenish it will change it will move the planet the animals do not need us we are not indispensable and what we are doing is we are definitely hurting ourselves so whatever we do we will be anthropocentric but what I am saying is that we have to be anthropo-ecocentric, where we actually position ourselves, not in the center of things, but in the circle. So there's the, uh, the triangle there, for instance, and I've thought about this, this, this symbol of the triangle, and man is at the very top of that triangle. No, it isn't. <laughs> man is actually part of the foundation. If we're thinking about, if we're going to look at the triangular relationship, then the, very, the bottom line is nature, not because it's not the, the thing that matters, but because actually it's the foundation. There is nothing without nature, without you know, the ecological, uh, you know, the ecosystems within which we live. There is nothing without that. And then nature has created all life, whether it's the fauna, flora, biota, all life is created through this ecosystem, you know, through this interaction between air, fire, water. So man is not at the top because man is superior. Man is at the top because man has actually, you know, been able to manipulate a few things and thinks that, yeah, I'm the boss. Mm. If we look at it from an ecological perspective, then we need to learn to balance our desires, our tendencies, our ambitions. And we need to understand as well. Like I think that if we actually go back to the to the creation story, and then we look at our values as well, then we will change our values. It's not going to be about you know profits. It's not going to be about extracting things for our own uh, advantages and benefits all the time. It will actually be for the common good. The common good, and the common good is for balance. Now, <clears throat> sorry, I've put. Um, you know the, uh, uh, the 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 quote about well the uh, the bullet point about citizenship to uh, that was given to the bees it was given to the bees and 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 uh, the trees uh, uh, in uh, Costa Rica. So one example uh, of what this city has actually done, the sweet city as as they call it, is that now in any urban design bees have to be considered because they they have a stake they are stakeholders as well and here's the thing without bees you know without their wonderful pollinating activities we will die out so again it is anthropocentric but anthropo-ecocentric because we're also looking at their well-being in that sense it's a relationship i look after you you look after me it's um I think it's part of, part of the concept of Ubuntu or care ethics. It's relational. So if you want to move on to the next slide. Thank you. 
So essentially, uh, like I said, it's a revolution of the mind that I'm, I'm looking for or that I've been researching. How do we influence change in the world? And as much as we can fight for specific changes, you know those changes will only occur if there is actually that movement which actually exists and it is ongoing and it's growing and it's fantastic because the more research i've been doing on this and the more i see that actually there is definitely uh, uh you know progress and and by that i don't mean economic progress i mean you know consciousness is evolving human consciousness is finally evolving um and and we are we need to see the world from a holistic and integral perspective. Holistic meaning that we're looking at this in context, so human beings within the broader context, and integral in the sense that it's not just with you know our, our inner lives; it's how we also interact, you know, with our relations. And by that, I mean whether it's human, uh, you know, or interspecies relations as well. So, you know, Einstein said it very well. We can't solve the problems that we're facing today with the mindset that actually created them. We need to be creative. We need to be bold. We need to be brave. We need to show courage. Uh, and that's what Polly Higgins did um, when she, uh, uh, you know, when she started the whole movement for Ecocide, and which is gaining traction today. Um, and, and it's an incredible thing. I think that the idea of creating uh, you know, a criminal offence for endangering the earth or murdering or, or you know, violating the earth is definitely necessary, but equally it has to work with then the source because the idea of ecocide is, in my view, is, is punitive. It's the result of a behaviour, it's a sanction that comes after the deed is done. And I don't think that having an offensive ecocide in itself would be sufficient to stop this behavior. Um, so alongside ecocide, we have to also work on going you know, back to the source. We have to basically look at how we make our laws. And to do that, we have to look at what are our true values, what really matters. You know, life matters, the economic markets, they matter only insofar as they actually serve us. But the way that things are being done today, it's almost like we're literally alive only to actually get the economic markets going. But if the you know if humanity was to disappear, hmm. the economic markets would not even stand on their own. It would make absolutely no sense, and nobody would care. So you know what's really important is is how do we view the world? How do we even envisage our future? What are the values and the principles that we hold dear? What really matters to us? And, you know, as Capra and, uh, and, and Matei said, we need to start looking at an ecological, legal system, governance system, and so on. So there you go. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alex. Um, definitely very thought provoking. Lots of work to be done for certain. Um, okay, I'll stop screen share now. Bear with me one second. Hi, Tiffany, while you're, you're sorting out the screen share, I'm just gonna just ask Alex one question. I know there's lots of questions in the chat. It looks really interesting. And thank you for that blue sky thinking talk. Um, I was just going to say to you, Alex, tell, tell me if I'm right, it, it seems as if, although challenging this concept of uh, humans being, you know, the very top of the hierarchy, this concept of dominion, the approach that you're discussing also recognises that uh, humans hold the power in as a matter of practicality and so that means not that we have and can exercise complete dominion but that we must do so in a responsible way is that a fair summary yes i i, I don't like the idea of dominion I, I i wish we could just sort of completely eradicate it <laughs> but 
Um, but we have to start somewhere. It's, it's, gonna, it's going to be something that is progressive. And the only way to do that is to start you know, by little steps and, and, and changing that narrative then. So if we say, yes, you know, we do have an impact and we can't run away from the fact that you know, humanity has a major impact, we've literally, we've colonized the entire world. We've colonized the oceans. You know, whether we've done it physically, whether we've done it surreptitiously, I mean, you know, with the, the tiny plastic particles in the oceans, that's our doing. That's, that's actually a form of colonization, really. Um, we've colonized the air. So, you know, that's part of our nature, I guess, to an extent. And, and again, that, that's controversial in itself. But whatever we do next, then yes, we do have to do this with, we, do, we have to do this in a responsible way. When, um, you know, we, we think about us as being free or we want to be free. But what I have discovered in my own personal development is that once I realized that actually I am free, yeah, I am free to think whatever I want. I am free to have to hold any belief, any to have any principles as my as my main thing, and I am free to choose the life that I want to lead within you know the relative confines of of my environment and my systemic environment. I am free. Once I realized actually that nobody will tell me how to lead my life, that I can tell you know I can do this for myself, I started actually freaking out. <laughs> You know, my mom used to tell me what to do with my life. Now I choose what to do with my life and I'm responsible for my children. Once you know that you are free to do something, I think that there is an element of what do I do with it? And it's the choice that is scary. Choosing what to do. How do you choose? How do you make that choice? How do you know it is right? How do you know this is the right thing to do? It's based on basically what matters. What do you want? How do you envision the world? So, the but we also have to accept where we are today. We have to look at what is with you know, an eye for what will be and what we want. The future doesn't exist. Only now exists, the here and now. What we have done in the past is there to inform us. And I, I love that song from Bob Marley. It's like, you know, you have to know your history to, you know, in order to know where you're going to go. But, you know, between the history and where I go, actually, you know, it, it's here that matters. And right here, right now, I make my decision. And I want, I think we should make our decision responsibly. And by that, it means that we need to own our principles. We need to own our values. Now, if our values are that, yeah, I'm still, you know, top of the chain, king of the, the animal kingdom, and I just want to get whatever I want, well, then we have to bear the consequences. But if my value and my value is very much that I, I, what matters to me is my relationships, my relationships with people. And, uh, and frankly, every time I actually get, get down a little bit, I'm, I'm always on, on my phone looking at videos of animals. And I have seen so many videos of animals that have made me feel very good about myself. But I mean, seeing, you know, fish looking for contact with, with, with human beings, you know, uh, um, having seen chicken, having some kind of inter, inter uh, you know, re relating with, with, with human beings. That made me realize that, oh my God, we are so arrogant. We think we own language because we have defined language as I'm making noise and I'm creating you know this sound that actually has meaning to which you know we have ascribed a meaning which changes by the way depending on, on, on people you know if I say tree everybody will see a different tree in their head so it has a different meaning but we own we think we own the concept of language we don't animals have their own language trees have got their own language strongly believe that energetic energy is a language in itself so yes you know to, to go, get back to your question um yes well we have an incredible impact on this planet so we have an incredible responsibility because with that freedom 
with that privilege to do whatever we want comes responsibility. And so the way I look at it is that human beings are here to serve, to be, to be in service to the common good. So thank you again so much to Alex, um, to Paula as well for your questions and being here tonight to help out.